and welcome to the Sunday Magazine's Book View series. Today we have with us author and publisher Ritu Menon. Welcome, Ritu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today we speak to her about her recent book, Zora. So, Ritu, the first question that came to my mind is why Zora? It's a very, uh, not everyone would pick this topic. So, why Zora? Uh, well, actually, um, a combination of uh, reasons, uh, Medha. One, uh, you know, she was, um, she is the only woman who was active in all the performing arts, except for music. So uh, dance, theater, film, television, that's one. Um, and the second is that she was performing up until the age of 100. So actually, she spanned the century. She, she was a part of what was happening in the performing arts within India and outside India for a whole hundred years. Now that, I don't know that there is anyone else who has that, uh, that kind of career and that kind of experience and that kind of success, actually. And yet, uh, we know so little. And yet, like all women in the arts, uh, she gets much less attention than let's say someone like uh, Ravi Shankar or um, uh, Prithviraj Kapoor, for example, uh, one of her mentors, one of her very yeah. important uh, influencers. Um, of course, hundreds of uh, film stars and sports people and so on, all of who, have not only shorter careers, but actually, if you think about it, whose contribution um, is, is, is of, a, of, a, of a more, um, how should I put it, uh, uh, less enduring. Um, I don't want to make any value judgments, but what I'm saying is that this is a woman of extraordinary accomplishment. For me, it was very important to record that, to record that uh, remarkable accomplishment, but also to present her as a woman who was far ahead of her time in the choices she made, the decisions she took, the perseverance with which she pursued her career and lived the consequences of her choices. And so I think for me as a feminist, as a feminist publisher, but also as a feminist biographer, it was very important for me to be able to relate these two things and to situate her in a context. Where was she when she was doing all this? What was happening around her? Who were the other people whom, with whom she was working? Who were her colleagues? It was very important to me to be able to locate her in that way so that there's a kind of backdrop against which we read her life against which we understand this individual uh, for what she is. And actually for the enormous contribution she has made uh, for all of us. So that so, was, yeah. of course, primarily uh, many other little reasons. She's a wonderful woman to talk to and meet and mm -hmm. interact with and so on. But all that is part of her personality. This personality that Zora said you had, now, so if you think, at least for me, when I think of Zora Segal, the one word that comes to mind is unconventional. Yes. So how, yes. how difficult was containing this vibrant personality within the pages of the book? Oh, uh, pretty difficult, actually. I have to say, confess, Medha, because uh, first of all, uh, of course, she was unconventional. But in my view, uh, I think the word that came to my mind while I was working on it and and you know, uh, looking at all the stuff and reading about her, looking at the films, you know, trying to um, to do the research. Uh, the word that came to my mind was courage, because you can imagine in 1938, a young woman of 18, from a fairly conventional background, from the uh, aristocracy, decides that she's going to leave her home, leave her country, go to a strange place, Germany, where she doesn't know the language, she doesn't have family or friends, 
it was not a time where there was internet and uh, mobile phones and instant communication and WhatsApp and so on. And she decides that she is going to learn dance. How courageous is that? Uh, I'm not sure that too many young women would do it even today with, with all sorts of other supports that they might have, but she did. And then, so it was with every one of her decisions, every one of the choices she made to marry a man who was not of her faith, who was moreover, who was eight years younger than her. Now, again, uh, in the early 1940s, this was not common. It was not common at all, yet she went ahead and did it and so on and so forth, as you know from, uh, from what you read. Now, how do you uh, put all this into, uh, you know, uh, how do you compress that uh, 100 years of living and performing uh, into what, 200, 300 pages? So the challenge actually for anyone, and certainly for someone who's trying to write the life of a person like her, is what do you select? How do you select what you're going to present? That will actually um, amplify her personality rather than uh, circumscribe it, rather than have people saying, oh, you didn't do such and so, or we didn't know about, um, we wanted to know more. Yes, if you want to know more, that's, that's a good thing, but it shouldn't be at the, I, I shouldn't be giving too much detail of what was less important in her life and not enough detail about what was more important in her life. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that kind of process of selection really, not easy at all, but it's one of those hard decisions you have to make. You just have to make it. Um, and you hope that it works or you hope that you, know, you, you, haven't, <laughs> you haven't done her an injustice. So it's it's a challenge always. So um, no, Zora had two huge personalities uh, guiding her in two phases of her life. One was Uday Shankar, one was Prithviraj Kapoor. Yes. So both of them in their own way, I mean, massively influenced her and made her who she finally became. So yes. who do you think? Uh, probably influenced her more in what way? I think both of them influenced her in different ways, equally importantly. Um, Uday Shankar, in terms of what she understood about the potential of her body, the, the physical intelligence that he emphasized always on what you could do with your body and what it meant to have the discipline that that body required in order to realize its potential. This, I think, stood her in very good stead throughout her career, throughout her career. That is to understand her body. And what she got from Prithvi Raj Kapoor, I think significantly, was how to work in a team, how to work with people. And what she understood about theatricality. You know, she always said, I'm a performer first and last. Everything I do is for an audience. She got that from working with him. Now, the thing is, she worked for almost equal periods of time with both, eight years with Uday Shankar, 14 years with uh, Prithvi Raj Kapoor, both uh, very major influences in her formative years for choice of career. After all, uh, Prithvi Raj had very little to do with dance. Uday Shankar had very little to do with theatre. Yeah. Now, it was her great good fortune that she seized the opportunity with both, with both of them. This is what I meant when I said she had in the courage of her convictions. She understood what she could get from Uday Shankar and she went for it. She understood what she could get from Prithvi Raj and she persevered with it. Now, the big question is, the big question in my view is, what if partition hadn't taken place and she had continued with dance in Lahore? 
what would have happened? Would we have remembered her as a dancer or as a teacher? Because she was both. She was doing both. She was a teacher with Uday Shankar. She was a choreographer with Prithvi Raj. And then later an actress. And yet her subsequent career was only in acting. She never danced again. She never danced after she left India, after she left uh, Bombay and Prithvi Raj Kapoor. So I, I would say that both of them contributed in very significant ways to each of her career choices. And what she acquired in England, which is equally important in my view, not a single individual, but a culture of professionalism, which was very important for her throughout. She always said, even informally in conversation, theater Hindustan mein iski professionalism to hai nahi. Actors will turn up without learning their lines. Uh, they, will, they will look for their cues to prompters. They will, um, you know, because they know that the editing and the dubbing will take place later, they will fudge their lines. It used to upset her a great deal. Because she said, Deku, we are acting with each other. If I have to uh, respond to someone, he or she must emote and must elicit that response. This professionalism she found in, in British theater, the little bit that she did, and in British uh, television and film. That for her was very important. So I'd say that these, these uh, three very important uh, influences and skills and values that she imbibed uh, were what defined her uh, as an actor, as a professional, uh, and as an individual. She, okay. she never sort of deviated from this. And she used to say to me, uh, she, she said once, she said, Mujhe, uh, sare or sare no ke beech mein phone mat karna. I said, Kyu? Uh, she said, Main apna riyaz kar rahi hoti. She was 98 years old. She said, Main apna riyaz kar rahi hoti. I said, Aap is sumar mein kya riyaz kar rahi? And she said, Kyu? Chontis uh, me uh, ka recitation. Yeah. And you know, this is astonishing. Astonishing discipline that she learned from both Prithvi Raj and Uday Shankar. That essential discipline to be able to get onto the stage and perform. But perform to the best of your ability. Not the kind of sort of, you know, chalta hai performance that we see quite often. So related to this answer, I have two questions actually. The first is, like you said, it was not a chalta hai kind of performance for her. Like many a time she was cast as this, you know, mischievous and lovable oh, yes. grandmother. Hmm. But it was not one of, like she would somehow make her mark. She would not let it become a cliche at all. No. I have another no, question it's... related to yes. this. Hmm. The other question I have is, uh, as, when you spoke of discipline, so while reading the book, I realized after I had finished reading and I was sitting and thinking about it, I realized that this, I mean, there was a certain sadness that I drew from the book, like oh, life was actually difficult. Very. With, uh, with all the laughter, all the smiles, it was a very, very difficult life. And to not give up, to maybe this discipline was the thing that kept her going and not give up. Two things. One, I'll take the second question first. Two things. One, the discipline that kept her going. And the second, as she said very candidly, she said, what choice did I have? I had to make the best of what I could do. I had to, you, you see, this thing about uh, never looking back and having made the choice to, uh, to, to, to pursue her career, not to abandon it and to give it her best meant she would take whatever roles she was offered because you know uh, she wasn't going to be a diva okay 
she this was this was her this was her profession if it was a small role it was a small role if it was a bigger role it was a bigger role as simple as that she was not waiting to be the star in anything she was waiting for work she was waiting for work not for stardom although of course she was very happy to to be popular and recognized on the streets and so on and so forth but that was not her goal so that's that it didn't that adversity that she encountered again and again and again uh, she overcame partly it was her personality i have to say this a lesser person or a less uh, shall we say a less uh, a, 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 a less strong person might have might have sort of uh, you know given up or given in um, but she didn't she didn't write till the very end and that to me is this business of having starch in your spine which allowed her and enabled her to overcome and the 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 first question uh, that you asked she never hesitated to improvise if she felt that there was something she could do that was outside the script with the director's permission she would do it so for example she did say look i know how certain figures of speech are used now if i have an english director um or an english uh, script writer who's not aware of them i can suggest it so obviously she said i wouldn't do it with someone like gurinder chadda but i might well do it with someone like ken mcmullen or someone else who is not familiar with usage or with someone of that class let's say a middle class punjabi dadi would speak but i can i can do that improvising so she was doing that which meant that each time she played that role she was slightly wackier slightly less predictable slightly funnier a uh, slightly more authentic this was a big thing you know because let's face it the stereotype was the peter sellers kind of stereotype of the of the of the bumbling indian mm -hmm. and of course there were no stereotypes for women and the interesting thing is that after her uh where are the grandmothers in in all these serials where have they gone yeah they are not there i mean she made she made the role so much uh, so much her own you know, that uh, she sort of has become now the the symbolic and the metaphoric and the whatever dadi for all time <laughs> almost yeah i mean i think after zora segel the only other character that i would remember is surekha sikri in badhai ho yes yes in she in theater again yeah yes absolutely yeah. uh, no you're right i mean i'm not saying that there haven't been others here but i'm saying as a character yeah as a type uh, that she played several times yes yeah uh, she managed not to uh, you know uh, do a, she managed not to make it a routine uh, performance oh, absolutely i mean even for yourself if you do a role so many times it begins to become you know uh, rehearsed yeah you know it begins to to look like it, mind you she did do this occasionally it's not that she wasn't hamming she did ham also i mean if you see her some scenes in bhaji on the beach i find she overplayed or some scenes in chini kam she overplayed but okay you know you're allowed to do that but then there are a simply brilliant performances in firm friends in tandoori nights they are they are absolutely perfect i mean she gets the tone just right okay so i have this uh, one last question for you uh most of our biographies end up putting the person on a pedestal so how can writers avoid this i mean huge uh let's say fall you know uh, i i have said this before that as for us biography is quite a new genre i mean we we are not we haven't been doing it for hundreds of years or anything so some amount of 
of um, you know uh, teething problems will be there um, and yes we do have a habit of venerating and of trying to present in the best possible light don't speak ill of people and so on and so on burani kehte kisi ka and so on okay now the thing is i do think that it's very important to be sympathetic to your subject you can't hate your subject you know while you're writing you can't go in with the intention uh, to debunk them uh, to expose them in in a in a negative way you go in with sympathy but with a very clear right assessment of who they are and if there are if there are these kinds of uh, shortcomings you must mention them i do think that that's important and i also think that you know if you present as a sort of um how should i put it as honest or as sincere a picture as as you can then you don't fall into that hagiographic mode you don't you know um, one thing that i find uh, that i i i regret about some biographies especially uh, of celebrities um and film persons um is that there's a lot of speculation you know they take a, a little bit of a, a sort of rumor okay or um a kind of um sensational bit of information and uh, weave a whole speculative uh, story or narrative out of it i think that actually is a disservice yeah. it it's unfortunate that 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 to me is almost as on the same level as uh, hagiographic you know both are erring on either side of the of the spectrum so it's it's a it's it's a toughish call but i think it can easily be uh, you know you with a little bit of of uh, sensible and intelligent and you know sincere uh, motive you can overcome it it's not such a difficult uh, it's not so difficult um okay okay thank you thank you so much thank you for taking out time today for this thank it was a, a wonderful pleasure. chat and a brilliant <laughs> book i must say again oh thank you very much meeta i'm so glad thank you and it was a pleasure talking to you